on, I'm doing a f***ing interview. I'm sorry, but come on. We all family. I ain't talking to strangers, he's my nephews. Be quiet. Check it out, though. Everybody wants to come to Hollywood and be a star. Guys, right in the center. But growing up black in the city of angels wasn't always heaven. We had a hell of a time making it in this city. People think it's all Hollywood lights, palm trees, and beaches, but it gets way deeper than that. Come and take a walk with us through the wild, wild west in LA. You're not from the real LA streets. If you've never been on your way to Hollywood and had to sit on the curb due to LAPD pulling you over and searching your car. You're not from LA if you've never been banged on. You're not from LA if you've never gotten some t-shirts from one of the swap leaks. Cali is a place where people say, oh wait, you live in Los Angeles, so you're thinking Hollywood, you're thinking of all of this greatness, and in all actuality, it's a cage jungle. When you've been outside your whole life, walking in groups to the park to go swimming, or going to the mall, or taking the bus to Venice Beach. You've definitely been to Sloss and Swap Meet. <laughs> you've been to Lemert Park, probably a USC game. You've cruised down Crenshaw. So growing up black in LA, it's fun. Black Los Angeles, it's family. People see Los Angeles as this big place, but I know black Los Angeles. I work in the black community, I live in the black community, my family's black. I network with black officials, elected officials, professionals, entertainers, and it's nice. <laughs> it may be big and we may live in pockets, but if you know one person only, they can connect you to somebody else. It's like a big city and a small town all wrapped into one. I'm the West Coast diva, tell them follow the leader. Catch me on a billboard moving like a heat seeker. It's yo, yo, the queen of South Central. I'm the protege of Ice Cube. I am Yolanda Whitaker. I started rapping when I was in junior high school. We moved from Carson, California into Los Angeles and Ice Cube was looking for a female MC. He was leaving NWA. T-Bone, who became a member of the lynch mob, introduced him to me and Cube and I signed a deal with Sylvia Rome. Atlantic Records, and yeah, my career started then. So being a female MC in Los Angeles in the early 90s, you had to have heart. Because it was such a male-dominated field that in order to even express yourself, like there were so many artists that was coming out saying, you know, a bitch is a bitch, whether I'm poor or rich, and I ain't the one. Ice Cube, can you get my nails done? Those type of songs. So when I was coming up, I was hearing all that. I started my journey in hip hop, defending women in hip hop, at the same time admiring men in hip hop. To be black in Los Angeles, for me, it has been to have respect from where I come from. It was such a stereotype to say you were from South Central Los Angeles. It was so many gangs. They gave us this title of gangster rap. With all the controversy surrounding so-called gangster rap and its alleged negative effect on America's youth, I don't want to be labeled as gangster rap. Although I could jump right in. You say it, I'm doing it. You know, two times, outside, inside, I'm in it. When it started creating labels, it made you feel like I didn't want to be a part of that. But to come back in it and say, I know who I am. I represent where I'm from. I understand who I am. I have a duty to uphold with the community. Kids who are like me, who look up to me. And I think that's where I get my blessings from. Without rap music, without those that really paved the way, people wouldn't know Compton around the world. My name is Asia Brown, and I serve as mayor of the city of Compton. And I grew up in a small town called Altadena, just north of Compton. It's really inspired to just make an impact. I always wanted to really bring my gifts, my talents, my skills back to my people, my community. I was just unhappy with the status quo, and after looking around and trying to find some new leadership, I knew that I had to step forward and walk out by faith. 
One of my kind of major contributions to the city is really just shifting culture and giving Compton a fresh perspective. People thought that they knew Compton and I came in really being a direct shift in that paradigm and I was able to really reintroduce Compton. We just turned 133 years old yesterday, so we have a diverse, rich culture, rich history that isn't only one decade or two decades. I would say that I have definitely laid the foundation for my vision for Compton, which was really built on family values, strategies for economic development, growth, wealth. We've secured capital, a new development, really secured new funding for our community and just changed our trajectory. So I'm really proud of the work that we've been able to do the last eight years. LA is the best city in the USA. My name is Kayla Greer, also known as Chef KK. I am born and raised in South Central LA. What inspired me to become a chef was just growing up with sisters and brothers. My mom not always there to cook food. So I just naturally gravitated to the kitchen and then I had a job at Jama Juice. And out of all the jobs that I had, I was like, dang, this one flew by. I just realized that like this was something that I don't mind working hard at and I knew that it was a lucrative business. So I just went to LA Trade Tech in downtown with a trade school, very black, and I finished and um, now I'm here. It's hard to just say that a client took my business to one level to the next because it's just been a constant grind. Like I literally have been doing it for almost 15 years from selling food on Instagram and then working with Drake. I think he was that one to put me in a different light as far as more people actually realizing like, oh shoot, this is like for real, for real. And I just think that my consistency and my real passion and love for cooking that has brought me to where I am. I think it's genuine and like my clients know that and appreciate that. LA is literally whatever you want it to be. I'm Tristan J. Winger, and I'm from South Central Los Angeles. I went to King Drew Medical Magnet High School in Watts, and so I was supposed to be a doctor. I flunked out of college. I just was bored, like it's not something that I wanted to do, and usually that's a sign that you're not supposed to be doing that. Entertainment came easy. So Amazing Grace Conservatory definitely kind of fostered my creative Heart. This is a school that I went to when I was in high school for acting, singing, and dance. This laid the foundation for me and entertainment. I didn't consider entertainment as a career. This was just something that I always loved to do. Years after flunking out of college, I linked up with my friend Issa Rae. We did plays together in high school. I hit her up on Facebook. I was like, hey, let me know if you need help with any of your shows. I want to get back into acting. And she sent me the script for the fourth episode of Awkward Black Girl. I read the script and I was like, okay, cool. Who am I going to be? I'm going to be one of these lead characters. Maybe the guy that's like your boyfriend or something like that. She's like, oh, no, you're going to be Darius. Quiet voiced, barely talks, and he didn't have any lines. I was like, oh, okay, cool. You know, this will work. And so I saw that it said that he was this baby voice dude. So I started playing with this guy, just kind of had this whisper and just kind of talking like this. And that's when things started to take off because then she released that episode and people love that character. And it just made me feel like, okay, maybe I can do this. So I was working a retail job and I got the opportunity to audition for this character on Insecure called Thug Yoda. And Issa sent me the script first, and she was like, let me know what you think of this character. I think this would be like the perfect role. And he's an LA dude. And he'd be like, hey, yo, what's up, Tristan? Hey, I like your dog. What's his name? His name Frito, like the corn chips. And I was like, okay, I know who this guy is. And this is my first role on TV, and it's on HBO. Then just happened to be with someone who I've known for a while, went to high school with. It's just beautiful. And also, she's from LA. And it's a story about LA, so I, I love it. I'm grateful for it. I believe people from L.A. experience having confidence that wherever you go, you can make it happen for yourself. Because if you can't make it in L.A., you can't make it anywhere. My name's Gil Matthew. I was born in Queen of Angels Hospital. It's just adjacent to downtown Los Angeles. This is Inglewood, which is now classified as Inglewood Heights. Inglewood is now undergoing a, a renaissance or a change. When I moved here in 1964, we were the first black family on the block. More blacks started moving to this area of Inglewood. Around 1968 is when you had white flight from this area. Inglewood is now majority black, but you're having whites that are moving back to Inglewood.
Growing up in Inglewood was a unique experience because you didn't know you were black. You weren't considered or seen as a black person. In this area, you had kids. We all played together. There was no white and black. Each block would go down to the bottom of the hill and we'd have football games. I believe growing up in LA, you experience a level of diversity that you don't get in most places growing up as a youth. And what I mean by that, several different languages. You have people from all different countries and kids come together and you learn about different foods. You learn about different customs. Everyone, for the most part in the city, is very accepting of that. So from that standpoint, most people know a little bit of Spanish in this town. Whereas I've been in other cities, they don't know. L.A. is fun. It's diverse. It is stimulating. It's entertaining. L.A. is a lot of different things to a lot of different people, depending on what part of L.A. you live in. My name is Pamela Bakewell, and I'm originally from New Orleans, Louisiana. My family, quite a few of them, migrated to Los Angeles, so I'm rather bi-coastal, but I've been here for a very long time. The Bakewell Company, <laughs> we are a very diverse company, believe it or not, not ethnically, you know, everything we do is black, but the Bakewell Company is a real estate development company. My brother, Danny Bakewell Sr., is the chairman of the board. I'm the chief operating officer. We also own, under that, Bakewell Media, which has the Los Angeles Sentinel newspaper, an 87-year-old newspaper, black publication, the Los Angeles Watts Times, which is another black publication. So the Bakewell Company is really, really invested in black media. We also come from a civil rights family that is invested in the nonprofit community, the Brotherhood Crusade, which my brother is one of the co-founders of with Walter Bremont. It's a 50-year-old institution. So we kind of use it all for the good of the community so that we're continuing to do well and do good at the same time. But it's kind of just embedded in us. I, I just think it's, it's in our DNA. Taste of Soul returns to Los Angeles. Over 350,000 people on Crenshaw Boulevard. Taste of Soul. So Taste of Soul, <laughs> believe it or not, my brother had this vision that we should have a festival where we can bring black people together to celebrate being black. He really was mimicking what we grew up with in New Orleans. Pretty soon he was going to have a Mardi Gras in the middle of Crenshaw, but that's kind of what it is. <laughs> We estimate we don't like to go any higher to about 350,000 of our closest friends <laughs> that show up every year. The Taste of Soul has officially been touted as the largest one-day free family festival in Los Angeles County. I just want people to know that it is possible, and I'm an example of it, to find success living, breathing, and working in your own community. And that does not mean that you're racist or you're prejudiced. It just means that you have love of self. So we intend to stay that way. We're proud of it, but that's kind of how we run our business. In LA, we got this gang culture that can swallow you up if you let it. If you visit in LA, you better off just wearing black to be on the safe side. I'm Inglewood Tip, born August 7th, 1982, in Los Angeles, California. It's a little different now, but coming up, you know, you got these pockets in the larger cities, LA, Compton, Inglewood, Long Beach, Watts, etc but you have these pockets which are specific neighborhoods. So you might have the 30s Crips, the 60s, then the 80s Bloods, the 90s Crips, the Rolling 100 Crips, which are all, you know, a few square blocks away from each other. But, you know, it could be a war between these two hoods. You know, you got Bloods who wear red and are adjacent to Pa Rules who wear burgundy. Because from my understanding, that was the first blood set. Then you got the Crips. They wear blue. Nowadays, these kids got the tattoos of the hood on their face, so no matter what color you got on, so you just gotta know where you at. 
geographically. So it's a lot of reasons why we join gangs. You got some kids don't have a family. Others do it for protection. My personal experience, living where I lived, you know, we walk to the store and the Crips got something to say. Living over there, a group of four boys walking, we're automatically affiliated and don't have on no red. So it got to a point to where we were dealing with all of the issues of being from the hood. And I personally developed a hatred for some other hoods. So at that point, I wanted to be a part of it. I wanted to go in and make my name because I was dealing with the issues already. So why not? I'm from Inglewood families. My hood is Crenshaw and Manchester. Inglewood is a small city. It's 95% bloods. It's a couple small crib hoods. They do what they do, but I'm from a blood area. And, you know, it was rough. Living on Crenshaw, everybody's passing through. So we were kind of in the middle of it. You know, I grew up two blocks from the Inglewood Cemetery. So all the funerals in LA are passing through our hood. So it's Cribs blood. So it might be a funeral passing through that turned into a shootout. Like it was, it was live back in the day. When Nipsey passed, it was like a dark cloud over the city for real. I never seen nothing like that before. His passing brought all kind of people together. Now, my city and Nipsey's hood, oil and water. So everybody wasn't really with it, but some people were, and that's the start. There are many people that want to get out, but they feel that they're um, really in ingrained or, or trapped in cycles of a lifestyle. Maybe they're multi-generational, and so it's difficult to sometimes forge a different pathway. But I think that even the, the evolution of where gangs are now, it's, it's still continuing to change. L.A. is home. L.A. is Hollywood. L.A. is the 6-4 and Paula on Dayton's. My name is Chris Ball. I'm from South Central Los Angeles, and I was born December 27, 1977. My name is Chuck Ball. I was born in Torrance, California, and I'm from the suburbs of L.A. When's your birthday? July 21st, 87, baby. What's poppin'? I first got introduced to cannabis when I was about 10. When I turned 16, my cousin was the neighborhood weed guy, and uh, he was fresh. And I wanted to be like my cousin, so I asked him to give me my first ounce. And, you know, he taught me how to break it down, bag it up. But I was really no good at it. You know, back then, I was more focused on sports, you know, girls, stuff like that. My entrepreneurial journey, that was the beginning of it, but, you know, it hadn't really set in yet. So when I graduated from high school, moms and pops, you know, had a conversation and let me know that they couldn't afford to send me to college. I wanted to enroll in junior college because I wanted to try to get a football scholarship. So I called cousin Earl back and I was like, yo, cuz, like, run that back. You know, let me get that ounce again. Only this time, you know, the stakes were higher and I knew I had to make it work. And that's what I did. You know, I sold weed out of my backpack to put myself through junior college until I got my scholarship to Berkeley. You know, once I got to college, I put it down never touched it again until I got over into Canada and started playing, you know, football over in the CFL. And that's when I got bit by the cultivation bug. That was the first time I had ever seen weed go from, you know, seed to harvest. So once I saw that, I was like, I knew that that's what I really wanted to do. I was just in love with the plant. I was in love with the process. Finished playing over in Canada and I was getting weed, you know, from over there to over here. And so this is where I really started making really, really good money in the black market or traditional market. I got really popular until I attracted the attention of the federal government. So in 2010, I was indicted for the possession and conspiracy to distribute 2,000 pounds of weed across the United States. I was looking at a 10 year mandatory minimum. I played out for three years and paid my debt to society. And when I was locked up, there were two older gentlemen in the prison. They came up to me and they were like, yo, Chris, you know, we kind of know about your case. Why were you selling, you know, all of that weed for somebody? Why weren't you just growing it yourself? And I said, I don't know. I don't really know how to grow. So boom, I'm out. I've never grown before. 
I didn't know what I was doing. I think the first year I never even got through a full harvest. A year after that, we finally started harvesting. And because I had been trapping so long, all of my buddies owned all the Prop D compliant stores. So I signed up for the co-op and I was a caregiver and I would be able to go in there and sell them product for the patients. We did that for a good like two or three years, you know, until I was introduced to the social equity program in Los Angeles. And that's when Ball Family Farms was officially born. Seed hunt begins with a perfect five phenols from Ball Family Farms. Ball Family Farms is one of the first fully vertically integrated social equity licenses in Los Angeles, California, and I am the CEO. And I am the business of Ball Family Farms, the brain, the legalization of it, outreach, the programs, the communication, everything. There you go. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. You know, as we started to get to the legalization of cannabis, I went to college, played ball, graduated, did my thing. I was in corporate America, learning the structure of how things of the other side of the world work. When I started to have more faith in the state that they were gonna do the right thing, I started working with him. Yeah, yeah. 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 I knew who I was in the cannabis industry and in the street, you know, and I knew what I could bring to the table, but I knew I needed someone to kind of protect me from myself and protect me from the decisions that I had grown accustomed to making, you know, to succeed. And so I was like, you know, if I can get my little brother to come in and kind of handle the money, the admin stuff, the back end stuff, I can kind of focus outside of the facility and build the brand. Now that cannabis has been decriminalized and deschedulized, right, it's no longer a scheduled one drug. I think it's important that the people who have been incarcerated and carry this industry on their backs, I believe it is important for those people to be released from prison. I didn't get indicted by the feds for this because I didn't know what I was doing. I got indicted because I was having success at it. I had figured something out and how to make money and they couldn't put a tax on what I was doing. There are a lot of other Chris Balls still sitting in prison to this day. And if you let those guys out and give them an opportunity to participate like I've gotten, they would probably have the same success. And then being able to each one teach one, you know, then turn around and help another person of color or a person who has a felony that wants to participate in the space and be able to trailblaze and help them get into the space and maybe change the trajectory of their family as well. You know, so I think it's extremely important for those people to be released and given an opportunity. In 1992, during the Rodney King trial, before the verdict was uh, given, when everyone's waiting, I was visiting my father at his drugstore down at 40th and Western. He had been in business there in over 50 years. And it was at that time we saw a change in attitude. And I asked my father to close up early. He refused to close up early, kept his same hours, and then we left. It was that time where things got pretty heated not only in that area, but also in the Crenshaw district as well. I was watching the news and they had news crews going all over the city, specifically in a number of black areas. I saw that one of the stores on the back end of the drugstore was on fire. And at that time, there were no fire departments coming in and putting out any fires. There was no representation of any social services such as police, fire departments that were coming out and assisting at all. They basically let everything burn down. I think what we saw during that time was a level of hopelessness and anger. And people didn't have an outlet to express that anger. In 1992, I was two years into being yo-yo. I was in New York and my city was in an uproar. I wanted to be there so bad. Not that I needed a TV. Not that I needed furniture. I wanted to be there to riot. I wanted to express my frustration. I wanted to be there to bust out the window with y'all. These assholes have been manipulating us. By the time they made me put my mouth to the cement, I wanted to be there with y'all. I was so mad that I never got a chance to express that. When I realized the power of music and the power of lyrics, the responsibility that I had for not just me 
but my community changed me. It changed my whole direction for music. I don't even think I've ever been the same since then. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. I do believe that there are some parallels with the George Floyd riots and the 1992 riots, but I feel that today, the magnitude is so much greater because it's rippling around the nation and around the world. In the 1992 riots, I felt that the whole world watched but in this season, people participated and they went out and protested and they stood for justice. And I believe that in our lifetime, we've seen such a, a radical exposure of racism and where for the first time in my living lifetime that people couldn't deny its existence and couldn't deny that white supremacy is still alive and well. So I believe that there's been such an awakening that although it's been difficult and hard on everyone, it's so necessary. And, and that alone just gives me hope. I mean, I got strong opinions on, on police, and part of it is the fact that they bear no personal responsibility or financial responsibility in the damage that's done. And I think if you have a person that has to participate in the settlement of any wrongdoing, I think you have a tendency to do your job a lot better. You know, the error is to be human. But the bottom line is we all know where the line is drawn. We all know right from wrong. NWA said the police, and now they're saying defund the police. Well, because you don't know who's who. You don't know who's who. I think people misunderstand what defund the police really means. The whole system in itself needs to be blown up, and something new needs to be rebuilt, because there's no rehabilitation involved. And it's a cycle in this country. It's never going to be changed, because it benefits certain groups of people way too much for them to back off on that. Why would you make the plan feel even if you have an advantage? I've been pulled over by the police before in my life and I, I felt the same way as I did as a civilian than as I did as an elected official. I was concerned about the safety of my family, my child, my husband, and I've had um, just many just poor experiences in my life, so I was definitely on the defense um, and it's just something that all black people go through and it's just so unfortunate that literally your pulse beats faster, your heart starts racing, sometimes you start sweating, you have a, a, a physical response to an emotional condition and we've been disproportionately conditioned to have these reactions to the police and it's unacceptable. The facts are adding more police does not make a community safer. We've proven that in Compton with our pilot programs with gang intervention, we had the lowest level of homicides by empowering the community, by empowering former gang members. For me, I just believe that we need a whole new system. We need to come in with a, a new mentality, a new baseline. So defunding the police, it will have its own evolution, its own time, but it's something that is very necessary because we cannot continue to put money in a broken system and expect different results. What do we want? Justice! When do we want it? Now! now. What do we want? Justice! Justice. Activism in this city means to be more politically aware and be aware of the systems, how they work, and who you can contact. You're six degrees of separation. Somebody knows someone where you can always get a phone number, get your hand on it, someone that will speak up. But you have to be aware of how the system works. Activism is really about being active in the things that we believe in and that really advance culture and quality of life for our people, all people. And I think Los Angeles has been such a sounding board for the rest of the country um, and really being able to activate and mobilize on issues that maybe take longer or um, really have more resistance in other parts of the nation. So I think Los Angeles will continue to lead the way um, in terms of bringing new policy forward, Measure J, Prop 47, things that really are restorative justice work. Instead of building more prisons, there are actually funds diverted now to really prevent incarceration and to really humanize the experience of so many people. And that's something that should be commended and multiplied throughout the nation. You know, history is not here. We vote here. We have politicians here. We have community leaders here. They are really just paint on the wall in Los Angeles. You got me? I'm all right, brother? Go a little harder. Okay, got you. Okay, got you. Okay, got you. Go harder.
If you were ever to hold the representatives here in Los Angeles accountable of what they should contribute to Los Angeles, South Central, Watts, Inglewood, they could never man up to it. Nobody ever holds them accountable for what they should represent here. What is your position here in South Central Los Angeles on 106? What is your role? What do you play? What are you giving? Do you just want our vote? Don't get me to start preaching. I'll run for mayor next year. Not, not today. I don't want to spark up nothing and I don't want to get any feathers ruffled, but they're going to see me and they know I'm coming for them because they will represent our city. And if not, they're going to get the hell out of here, period. I like my legacy to be that I'm a woman of God first. I'm a good mother, grandmother, sister, aunt, family person, a good business woman, a mentor, an unselfish, ethical leader that really cares about her community and making sure that we pass on our history to our, our young people. I'd like my legacy to be that he was, a, he was a good guy. He had great relationships. He liked to laugh and he left this world a better place than what he found it. I want my legacy to be fearless. And what I mean by fearless is I was always afraid. I was always scared. But I just had to say yes and let God say no. And I had to always show up and represent who I was. My legacy is just going to be Kayla, who got out the mud, who really made her way from Slauson and Crenshaw to William Sonoma and all around the world and back. I mean, my legacy is gonna be, it's gonna be nice. It's already nice, so. First thing that comes to mind is a legacy of love. And what that means is making sure that I know my history and I work on myself and whatever it is that I need so that I can pass that down to my children. I would love my legacy to be that I left love for my city that I really lay down my good years for my community and then I really imparted hope and activated a whole new generation. I would like my legacy to be Tip was known as a fearless individual. He wasn't scared to walk by himself and he instilled that same thing into his son. I rock with my people. I don't waver. I'm not going to run when it gets tough and you know when it gets hard. Tip is uh, loyal to a fault to these streets. <laughs>